Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Wednesday evening Lenten service on April 5th, 2017. Tonight, Pastor Paul Koch brings us a message entitled, The Spirit of Life, Our Breath of Life, based on the reading from Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 7, and the third article of the Creed. Let's listen in. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, hopefully, as you know, hopefully you know, maybe that's a better way to put it, uh, throughout Lent this year, uh, we've been focusing on the, the, uh, the topic or the theme of the art of living by faith. And uh, if you've been here for all of the midweek services, you've kind of probably seen that one of the reoccurring things about that is that is certain sections of the catechism are being used, Luther's small catechism. And that's not an accident. Uh, this year, um, this October, we'll be celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And so what a great kind of uh, thing to, to build a Lenten theme around, the catechism. Uh, and my lot, and we actually, you know, chose this by casting lots. Have you heard that? We actually, yeah, uh, Pastor Barquette, Tim Barquette throws dice and, we, uh, and he assigns us what we got to do. But my, my lot fell on the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit in the art of living by faith. And so in, in the, the Old Testament reading, right, right from the get-go of all things, we find the Spirit of God at work, right? So there's the earth formless and void, it says, and the Spirit of God is hovering over the darkness, right? There's the Spirit of God at the very beginning. And the Spirit of God continues to be at work throughout the whole Old Testament. In, in, the, in the scene where the Israelites walk through the Red Sea on dry ground, it is, it is the Spirit that piles up the waters and dries out the ground for them to cross you know, on. And then um, throughout the rest of the Old Testament, it's the Spirit of God who is uh, uh, anointing and guiding and even protecting the great prophets, priests, and kings of God's people throughout the Old Testament. By the time we get to the New Testament, uh, the gr probably the greatest image is the baptism of our Lord, right? Comes up out of the water, the heavens rend open, the Spirit comes down like a dove, uh, lights upon our Lord Jesus Christ, anointing Him to be the final, the great, the only prophet, priest, and king for all the rest of eternity. And then, of course, Pentecost comes, right? And the outpouring of the Spirit of God upon the rest of His people and the church continues to grow and thrive. And so we're used to seeing and, and experiencing that the Spirit has a role to play in our faith. And it's, he's, it's been at work from the very beginning of creation all the way through to our lives today. The Spirit is at work. He's, he's doing his, his, his deeds here and now. When we confess together the Nicene Creed, in the Nicene Creed we say uh, some very beautiful uh, uh, things and give very beautiful titles to the parts of the Trinity. And I love that when we confess our faith in the Holy Spirit, we, we confess in that creed that He is the Lord and giver of life, right? That the Spirit of God is the Lord and giver of life. Uh, what, what's great about that is in the Hebrew of the Old Testament and also in the Greek of the New Testament, the word that we translate as spirit in the English, it could also be translated as breath. Um, I don't know if any of you who are parents have done this. You, I bet you you have. When, uh, uh, when our firstborn, Car, our oldest, I can remember bringing her home from the hospital that first time and being terrified, right? All of a sudden you have this responsibility, you know. But I can remember getting up in the middle of the night um, because it was quiet and walking over by her crib and getting down kind of low in the dim light because you didn't want to wake her, obviously, but watching to make sure that her lungs are moving, you know, that the breath is still going in and out because breath, means life, right? Breath animates things. It moves things. Breath is crucial when things are breathing, right? When we breathe, it means we're alive. And, and so in the, um, in, the, in the beginning of all things, when God forms Adam from the dust of the ground, it says he takes him up and he breathes into his nostrils and Adam becomes a living thing, right? The breath of God 
enters him and he becomes a living creature. Last Sunday, uh, in your Old Testament lesson, you had that the great image of Ezekiel in the valley of the dry bones. Remember, they stand up, but they don't have the breath of God yet. He prophesies one more time, and the breath fills them, and they become alive. They exit their graves. They become alive again, right? And so breath is, this, uh, is that same word for the Spirit. So you could probably translate in, um, in that story of Adam, you could say that God formed him from the dust of the ground and he spirited into him, right? He kind of puts his spirit in him and that spirit makes Adam a living being. And so, so when we breathe, when we, you know, inhale and exhale throughout our days, that's a, that's a testimony of the gift of life, the gift that the spirit has worked upon us. It's a wonderful thing. But what we're, what we're really pushing towards is, is to see how Beyond that gift of our physical life, how does the Spirit work to move us towards eternal life, to a life beyond just this physical time, the, the, the life to the new heavens and the new earth, the recreation of all things? How does the Spirit give that faith and guide that faith in our lives then? And now the answer to that is fairly simple. Um, and, it, and it's because it should be simple because you know your catechism. Right? I know you're the, those kind of people, right? You cherish your catechisms, right? You read them regularly, right? I know, right? You take it, here, you, you take it, you take it to the doctor's office when you have an appointment. You've got to wait around anyway. You might as well get out your catechism. You commit a little bit to memory. You impress your friends at cocktail parties with how you can <laughs> rattle off parts of the catechism, right? I know that's who you are because it's such a delightful book, but in case you forgot part of your catechism, I'll refresh just a little bit in the third article of the Creed. When we confess about the work of the Spirit, the meaning to the third article of the Creed begins like this, and you could say it along if you remember it, right? So it says, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, sanctified and kept me in the one true Beautiful, right? I can't do it. I'm not going to move towards my Lord. I'm not going to even be able to call upon him. But the Spirit, the Spirit comes. And the Spirit works upon me, right? He works upon you to enlighten you, to sanctify you, to call you by the gospel through his gifts. So the Spirit works through gifts, through stuff, to bring you to faith. And he does that primarily by speaking. Our God is a speaking God, right? Back to the story of Genesis, there in the beginning, right? Everything is made because God speaks it into being. He says, let there be light, there's light, right? He starts talking and he divides waters above and below. He, he sets sun, moon, stars in the sky. He fills the, the, the waters with fish, the heavens with birds. He does it all. He creates mankind by speaking it into being. He says it and it is so. Our God is a speaking God. In fact, it is the word of God that becomes flesh and dwells among us, right? The, the speaking of God lives on this earth, bears your sins, suffers, dies, and rises for you. God's words are powerful. They do things. And so the Spirit of God works through the spoken word. And you've heard the voice of the Spirit in your life. I know you have, because you're here, right? Right? You've heard it, and it sounds maybe not all that impressive at times, but it sounds like this. It sounds like, I forgive you all of your sins. It sounds like you are justified before your God, not by your works, but by Christ alone. It sounds like you are heirs of eternal life, jewels in the crown of God. You are the saints of the Most High. Those words... They're promises, promises of God, and they're given to you, and that is the voice of the Spirit spoken into you, breathed out by one person and received into your ears and into your hearts. The art of living by faith, then, is the art of holding fast to those words, which means something fascinating by our, about our faith. It means that our faith at its core is not an internal thing. 
Now, it, I know there's an internal component to faith, of course, right? But it doesn't begin there, right? Uh, most of our lives, we speak of faith as an internal thing. You know, people will talk about, well, you just need to believe in yourself or whatever it is. That it's always focus in on how you feel, your emotions, your desires, something like that, right? I, I feel this way. I want to express this way. It's always coming out from in. But, but the, the, as the catechism teaches, right, I can't by my own reason or strength do this. It comes from outside of me. It comes outside of you then, and it impacts your life. The, the gift of faith is not from within, it's from outside, and it's pulling your eyes away from yourself and onto something greater, right? Uh, think of it this way. If you can, um, this might be longer back for some of you than others, but think of the, the first time somebody you had a crush on actually said out loud, I love you, right? If you can think of that moment, those words outside of you, right? Outside of your emotions and your feelings, a word spoken by another to you can change your world. You might have repeated them to yourself over and over again. It made the world seem a little brighter, a little more joyful. Something like that, though far greater than that, is what we receive in the promises of our God. A word outside of you spoken to you, declaring His love for you. And so I guess our question becomes, well, where do we find that? Where do we look for that? Where should we expect that to be? Where do we hope that we will encounter this great word of God, this living voice of the Spirit at work? And the answer, again, is fairly simple and straightforward. You find the work of the Spirit on the lips of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? A pastor proclaiming the words of absolution on a Sunday morning, right? Uh, a parent speaking forgiveness to a child, friends to one another, encouraging one another, speaking the words of God to each other. These are the way in which the Spirit works, right? He works through means, through stuff. We're used to it other places, right? We, we gather around the Lord's Supper, in with and under bread and wine, we confess that we are feeding upon the very body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. We witness a baptism, and there in water and word, we see God electing, choosing this child as his own possession. And so we find that through words, through your words, the Spirit is at work. See, this is why you come together for church. I often think, I think there's two main reasons you should go to church. The, the first reason, of course, is that you go to receive something. You go to church to receive the gifts of Jesus Christ for you, right? To hear the proclamation of the word, to receive the sacraments for your blessing, for your salvation. And the second reason you come, the second main reason, is you come to speak those words to each other. Yeah, I've, I've been talking at my church lately how you know, I think we could kind of rethink the church as sort of like a motorcycle gang. You know, they, they've kind of gone along with it, I think, for a while anyway. But that, that we're in this together. We're like, our, we're like our, a club, right? And we gather together. And part of that coming together, so we speak. We become like an echo chamber of the voice of God for each other. And we, we speak those words of forgiveness over and over and over to each other. We speak of that love and that salvation. We may speak of correction and rebuke as well because we're seeking the truth, but that we speak the words to each other and there the Spirit's voice lives in our midst. It's a powerful gift. Now I know what you're thinking, you might, there, there's kind of two ways we, we hesitate in this. Is first is you, you know, you guys know each other better than I know you. Maybe you look around and you go, really? These folks, right? These are the ones that the Spirit's going to use to give me the blessings of God, right? Or the other way, I think maybe more frequently, and this is a problem I have, is you look in the mirror. I, I do this a lot. I look in the mirror and I see myself and I see my sinfulness and I see my failures. And I think, who am I? Who am I to speak these words to anybody? Right? I'm, I'm out of my league here. This, this, this isn't for me to say. 
And yet what we find throughout scriptures over and again, this is exactly the way God works. He, he seems to have great joy as he says, as St. Paul reminds us, right? He takes, he takes what is foolish in the eyes of the world, what is weak in the eyes of the world, and he declares this to be his wisdom and his strength. And he uses them again and again so that faith may be in His Word, in His Word alone, not in our accomplishments, not in our greatness, not in our cleverness, but in His love and mercy alone. And so the art of living by faith is the art of holding firm to those promises when we hear them. In the midst of lives where things don't seem like they're going the way they ought to go, where we maybe don't have it just the way we would like it to be, where things are getting turned upside down, where there's turmoil and suffering and struggle, yet still those words are spoken. Often from very unexpected places they come. And we hear them, receive them. And the art of living by faith is to cling to that. The art of living by faith is to see the Word of God at work. When a pastor speaks absolution, to see it at work when a, when a parent forgives a child for what they've done. To see it at work when a friend comes to you in a time of need, maybe offers a word of correction and then speaks that loving word of forgiveness to you. That that is the work of the Spirit. Again, we see it in the rest of our life of faith, in, in baptism, in the Lord's Supper. We confess it without hardly pausing. And so what I'm saying is the art of living by faith, the role of the Spirit is to see that just as He is working in that supper on the altar or through the baptismal font, so He is at work profoundly in those words of forgiveness, not just on the lips of those who you know, wear the fancy robes up front, but on the lips of each other. For God's Spirit dwells in you. And He dwells in you so that it might be breathed out into other people, spoken to them. It's amazing the great lengths our God goes again and again to come to us, to fight His way back into our lives, to grab a hold of you, and to declare you to be His children, to say that you are forgiven. In that text from Genesis, there the Spirit of God hovered over the waters before all things. And He hovered over the waters of your baptism as well. And God breathed the Spirit into Adam to make him a living being. And so the Spirit of God has been breathed into you yet again to promise you a life beyond this veil of tears. To promise you a more glorious day to come a day where there's no more suffering and struggle, where we will see as clear as day the promises of our God. Until that day, each day, you breathe in and you breathe out and you are reminded that you are filled with the Spirit. You are the forgiven children of God and you will live. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Midweek Lenten Sermon from Faith Lutheran Church in Moorpark, California. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com.